Handley's talk this talk this afternoon, you might consider engaging on Twitter or social media of your choice using using the hashtags hashtag RSA Madison and hashtag public memory present tensions. Um, so I think those are the majority of my housekeeping items. Amanda, am I forgetting anything? We're good? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead now and introduce our speaker. So Derek G. Handley, and this is on um, page six of your program, if you would like to follow along as I read Professor Handley's bio. Um, Derek G. Handley is an assistant professor in the English Department's Public Rhetorics and Community Engagement Program and affiliated faculty in the African and African Diaspora Studies Department at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. He is a Navy veteran who earned his PhD in rhetoric from Carnegie Mellon University. His book project, The Places We Knew So Well Are No More, a rhetorical history of urban renewal and the black freedom movement, looks at the rhetorical strategies and tactics used by African-American communities in Milwaukee Pittsburgh and St. Paul, Minnesota, as they resisted urban renewal. Before coming to UWM, um, Derek was a Chamberlain Project Fellow in English and Black Studies at Amherst College and a pre-doctoral Mellon Fellow at the James Weldon Johnson Institute for the Study of Race and Difference at Emory University. He has taught at Lehigh University, the United States the United States Naval Academy and the Community College of Allegheny County. His research interests include African-American rhetoric, urban studies and the black freedom movement. Um, and the title of his talk today is Hemmed In, Race, Place and Resistance in the City. And after um, Derek's talk today, we'll have plenty of time for a Q&A session. So um, please save some questions for the um, end of his talk. And without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Derek G. Handley. Thank you so much, Kelly. It is a honor and a privilege to be here. I want to thank the uh, Madison student chapter at RSA for putting on a great virtual symposium. Um, I read some of the abstracts of the graduate students who have been presenting and um, just amazing work folks are doing. Um, and thank you, uh, Kelly and Amanda, for helping me with all these technological issues. Uh, you know, you think be used to Zoom by now. Um, I feel privileged to be uh, sharing keynote speaking duties with Dave Tell. Um, I find his work inspiring and motivating in the field of public humanities. But it also gives you, and I hope you had a chance to listen to his uh, presentation yesterday, um, but it also gives you a chance to see the different stages of a public, public humanities project um, where Dave's work is already published and his um, website is up and running. Um, I'm in the beginning stages. I'm in the beginning stages of a public humanities project um, and in the process of, of, of writing my first book. So, um, but because of my presentation, I'll, I will, because I'll be talking about contested places and spaces, I think it's important for me to acknowledge those who lived in the lands prior. UWM, UW Milwaukee resides on traditional Apatawatomi, Ho-Chunk and Menominee homelands along the southwest shores of Michigami, North America's largest system of freshwater lakes, where the, where the Milwaukee, Menominee, and Kinnick Rivers meet in the people of Wisconsin's sovereign Anishinaabe, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Oneida, and Mohican nations remain present. So the title of my presentation, Hemmed In, Race, Place, and Resistance, um, in the city. And as you can see in this um, photograph in this opening slide, um, a member of the Milwaukee NAACP Youth Council with holding a sign, we demand um, fair housing. Okay, we got it. So in this talk, I would discuss two research projects that I'm working on, which explores the rhetorical history of African-Americans 
responses to restrictive housing covenants and urban renewal policies in the early to mid 20th century. Again, I'm gonna to try, to, try to use this one presentation to talk about two projects. Um, in essence, what I'm most concerned about is black agency in the urban North in the 50s and 60s. And what I mean by black agency is the civic actions taken by African-American individuals and organizations and their quests for what they deemed as, quote, full citizenship. And I'm also drawing upon the work of Malifi Asante, who suggests that African-American rhetoric is hinged upon the assertion of, quote, ethical leadership and, quote, seeing ourselves as agents in the world rather than objects or victims. First part of this presentation will discuss Black agency as part of a community public humanities project. And that project is titled Mapping Racism and Resistance in Milwaukee County. And I'm working on that project with my colleague, Ann Bonds, who's in the geography department um, here at UW-Milwaukee. Um, I highly encourage you to listen to um, two presentations that she gave on whiteness and white supremacy at UW-Madison's The Havens Wright Center for Social Justice. And I also want to thank Ann for helping me uh, put together this presentation um, and the photos. Um, if you watch her lectures, you'll see some of the same photos, same slides in, in this presentation. So um, our research project uh, represents the first effort to comprehensively document and map all racial covenants in Milwaukee County as well as uncovering the voices, narratives, actions made by African-Americans in Milwaukee in response to them. Um, I'm also happy to announce that we, we recently received two grants to help fund this project. Um, in the second half of this presentation, we'll briefly discuss my current book project on the African-American response to urban renewal in the 50s and 60s. And again, I'm hoping I can bring both of these two, tell both of these two projects in a coherent, coherent manner, or at least in the time given to present. So just to begin, here are some research questions that overlap both of these projects. Um, how did racial covenants operate in a specific urban and racial context together with other discriminatory housing policies and racialized patterns of development? And how did African-Americans respond and resist racist housing policies and targeted urban um, development? So I wanna begin my story here, not my story. Let me begin the story here. Here we have a picture of Zeddy Quitman Hyler. In 1944, Zeddy Hyler left New Albany, Mississippi. And if you listen to Dave Tell's presentation yesterday, uh, New Albany, Mississippi is two hours away from where Emmett Till was, would be murdered a decade later. later. Uh, Hyler arrived in Milwaukee as part of the late great migration of African-Americans traveling for better opportunities in the urban North. After a decade of living and working in Milwaukee, industries, and then later with the post office, he decided he wanted to build a house for his family. And he did this in Wauwatosa, a suburb neighboring the city's west boundary. In essence, um, like a lot of Americans in the 1950s, uh, Hyler wanted to live the American suburban dream, a dream that permeated consumer and popular culture after World War II. Here we see Hyler standing with some of her friends, some of whom who built his, uh, built his home. Um, again, when Hyler arrived in Milwaukee, um, it was a booming industrial city, breweries, factories. He occasionally held two jobs at a time to quote, to help us get ahead, as he said, and he eventually um, bought property in, a uh, neighborhood in Milwaukee called Brownsville, which you'll hear about later. Um, he lived there with his wife, Mary, his six-year-old son, and also his mother, Nancy. And then he decided he wanted to move to the suburbs. So what? Why is that important? 
right? Isn't that the American dream um, to work hard, save your money and build a bigger house for yourself? So here's why that's important. Wauwatosa, like many other places in Milwaukee County and across the nation, relied upon racial housing covenants to restrict any non-white persons from living in the community. On a slide here is an example of one covenant in the Washington Highlands section of Wauwatosa. And the covenant reads, at no time, the land included in Washington Highlands or any part thereof, or any building thereon be purchased, owned, leased, or occupied by any person other than of the white race. Now, this is the part of the covenant that I find very interesting. This prohibition is not intended to include domestic servants while employed by the owner or occupied in land included in a track. You can be in these spaces, you can be in these homes, but only if you're there as a domestic servant. So this was the situation facing Hyler and any other non-white person who wanted to move to a Milwaukee suburb. To, sub to subvert this racist practice, Hyler asked his white friend to buy the property and then sell it to Hyler. As a result, Zyler is the first black person to buy property in Wauwatosa. And then according to a Milwaukee news report, quote, shortly after construction began on his house, $800 worth of damage was inflicted on his property, and he received 75 threatening phone calls telling him to, quote, stay where you belong, end quote. But none of this deterred Hyler. He personally submitted his permit to build on his lot at 2363 North 113th Street in Wauwatosa. Recalling that time, Hyler says, quote, I went right to City Hall and applied for all the permits in person so they wouldn't have to guess who was coming to dinner. So if you're a fan of Sidney Poitier, you'll recognize that movie reference, uh, who's coming to dinner. Despite community resistance, Hyler built his house in 1955 and remained there until his death in 2004. Many other covenant breaking families across the nation face different outcomes, including mob violence, arrest, and loss of their homes. So where was it that Hyler was moving from? Here we have a map of a part of Milwaukee that is often referred to as the inner core. And um, in the smaller dark square was where African-Americans were regulated to in 1940. And then a larger square, how many were there in 1960? In Milwaukee, the number of African-Americans grew from over 8,000 in 1940 to nearly 22,000 in 1950 to 63,000 or just under 63,000 in 1960 and over 100,000 in 1970. So this progression of African-American population increasing. Um, I highly recommend um, a book, The Warmth of Other Sons by Isabel Wilkerson. It talks about the great migration. And here, and I just want to, I just want to pause here to think about this. Um, over a 10 year period, these increasing of African-American um, immigrants, if you will, from the, from the deep South and coming into the spaces and being restricted as to where they can live. So what you have is you have a sense of overcrowding. Some homes that were built for single families being divided up where families occupying rooms and bathrooms have to be shared. And this influx of new residents heightened racial anxieties of the city and brought racial prejudice by Milwaukeeans to the forefront of racial politics. Another way of thinking about this or, or, or visualizing this here we have a red line map of Milwaukee. And you get to see 
And this map is from 1938 of Milwaukee County. Um, the areas in red were designated areas not to uh, give loans to um, in uh, where African Americans normally would reside. So you have this system where, again, you're not allowed to live anywhere else. And the place that you do live kind of restrict the type of um, credits or loans you can get. So for a period of time, um, the housing that you live in, you know, will degrade over time and you don't have the resources um, to upgrade your homes or even your, your businesses. So redlining and racial covenants work together to keep African-Americans, quote, hemmed in. Now, I draw that line from um, a poem from Langston Hughes um, titled Restrictive Co uh, Covenants. When I move into a neighborhood, folks fly. Even every foreigner that can move, moves. Why? The moon doesn't run, neither does, does the sun. In Chicago, they got covenants restricting me, hemmed in on the south side, can't breathe free, but the wind blows there. I reckon the wind must care. Now, in addition to the rhyme scheme and the pattern and the rhythm and the flow of that poem, um, which I really enjoyed and, and a fan of Langston Hughes, but I also want you to pay attention to the title, the time in which this was written. It was in 1949. And it indicates how far back African-Americans have been aware and have been struggling against housing restriction. Of course, it goes even further back than that. According to history, uh, historian Joe Trotter in the early 1940s, NAACP attorney George Brawley made a survey of the Platts filed with the Register of Deeds Office of Milwaukee County founding that approximately, quote, 90%, 90% of the subdivisions which have been platted in the city of Milwaukee since 1910 contain some type of restrictive covenant that pledged the owner not to sell or rent to anyone other than the Caucasian race. Which brings us back to Zeddy, Zeddy Heiler. And because of what he had to overcome, because of everything he had to do, is why we can label his action of buying a land, building a ranch style house in a suburb, suburban neighborhood as a act of resistance. And in our public humanities project, we want to capture um, other examples, you know, want to capture examples like him um, individual as well as organizational resistance to these restrictive housing covenants. Um, as I said before, our project is um, called Mapping Racism and Resistance in Milwaukee County. And what's different about this project, and I think is identifying black resistance. While a growing number of scholars and organizations have mapped redlining and restricted covenants to visualize the legacies of discriminatory housing practices and their connection to contemporary patterns of racial segregation, none of these endeavors map resistance to restrictive housing covenants. As a result, the existing narrative neglects Black agency in challenging racial covenants in the ways in which their resistance has contributed to housing debates and civil rights activism. And I'm really particularly interested in the civil rights movement in the urban North. Our digital project seeks to address this gap through mapping and rhetorical analysis of racial housing covenants and resistance to them in Milwaukee County. Though racial covenants have been illegal for over 50 years and unenforceable for over 70, they remain embedded in property deeds throughout Milwaukee County as evidence of the ways in which racism and segregation systems map race and urban development. So to do this, we're gonna be drawing from the innovative methodology developed by the Mapping Prejudice Team and their collaborative mapping of racial covenants in Hennepin County, Minnesota. Um, 
Um, I highly recommend you take a look at the website mappingprejudice.org um, and, and, and see the work that they've done in mapping these covenants. Our digital humanities approach will, be, will bring together GIS-based data visualization, archival and citizen research, and community engagement to construct a website and an interactive digital map of all racial covenants recorded in Milwaukee County between the years of 1910 and 1960, as well as the challenges to them until the passage of the Open Housing Act of 1968. Our plan is to recruit citizen researchers by holding community workshops on racial covenants in Milwaukee and surrounding suburbs, to visit high school and college classes, and to use various social media platforms. The outcomes from this research, again, will include a interactive digital resource about covenants, about covenants and challenges to them in Milwaukee County, a collaboratively produced map visualizing the geographies and temporalities of covenants and covenant resistance, and a data set of racial covenants that will be accessible to the community, policymakers, and other researchers. So that's the plan for the, the digital mapping project. But what about the neighborhood where Hyler moved from? This is a 1950s view of Bronzeville, the heart of African-American business community and what many Milwaukeeans call the inner core. By 1965, 98% of African Americans lived in the central city of Milwaukee, which at that time was the largest concentration in the nation. And this large concentration would leave African Americans vulnerable to the racist urban planning practices of city, state, and federal officials who targeted the economic neighborhoods, the economic centers of many African American neighborhoods. A significant part of Bronzeville was destroyed in order to build the I-43 freeway. Despite their minority status in Milwaukee, African-Americans accounted for more than half of the people that will be displaced by the construction of Milwaukee highway system in the 1960s. And the housing that was uh, tore down, not enough of it was replaced. And I just want to pause for a second. I just say I find this photo um, fascinating. I find this photo haunting. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the name of the couple. That's something that I want to find out. I want to know their story. And I think this is what we talk about in public humanities. These are real people that are being affected. You know, um, how did they own their home? Did they build it? Did they move here looking for a better place? Where did they go? Or where couldn't they go? Um, there are so many questions that I'm that I'm that I'm thinking about that 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 hopefully that we can do um, um, with this project, but also in thinking about it in terms of my book project. These actions were a direct result of American cities' love affair with urban renewal. Only weeks after this US Supreme Court passed down its verdict of Brown versus Board of Education, President Eisenhower signed into law the Housing Act of 1954. Although both of these legal milestones would have significant consequences for African-Americans in Cold War America, it was the Housing Act of 1954 that drastically altered the living conditions of vast numbers of African Americans across the United States. The passing of the Housing Act of 1954 and the Highway Act of 1956 gave American cities unprecedented power to build arenas, highways, apartment buildings, and shopping areas, which transformed the material layout and appearance of their cities. And unfortunately, a lot of this work that they were doing were not benefiting African Americans. And just on a side note, just on a side note, um, for any of the political wonks out there, um, you might be aware, probably already aware of uh, President Biden's current infrastructure plan 
Uh, and he plans to include $20 billion for a program that would, quote, reconnect neighborhoods cut off by historic investments. And also the transportation secretary, uh, Mayor Pete, um, has been receiving criticism from politicians for saying that, quote, there is racism physically built into some of our highways, end quote. So urban renewal and highway construction projects took large new chunks out of the African-American community. This is a, a, a outline of um, the boundaries of what was called Brownsville. And as you can see, a highway runs through it. So let's think about this for a second. So um, again, um, you are telling people where they can't move and then you reduce the housing in the only place in which you can live. So this is the moment that I am focusing on in my book project. This moment in time, this moment when the bulldozer is about to come to start tearing down neighborhoods. This is what I am focusing on in my book project. So in the mortal words of Marvin Gaye, I want to know what's going on. What's going on in a black community as this was happening? What conversations are taking place in the churches, the barbershops, and the hair salons? What articles, what stories, what citizen on the street conversations are being had in the black newspapers? Or to put it in the genre of academic discourse, I am asking what were the rhetorical, civic, and discursive responses, responses to the exigency of urban renewal by African-Americans in the Northern cities like Milwaukee? What kinds of spaces for deliberations or forms of civic engagement were created in response to urban renewal? And what was their impact? Uh, so this is what my book is gonna explore. I'm thinking about urban renewal as a, a complex rhetorical situation. And um, in order to uncover perspectives uh, of the black pre freedom movement, um, I want to look at the actions. I want to look at the sometimes paradox, paradoxical actions of cooperation and resistance by African Americans with city officials. And as was said in my introduction, my case studies for this work is Pittsburgh, Milwaukee, and St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, and I think I should probably pause there for a second and recognize, you know, all the um, the families of Dante Wright and, and George Floyd and everything that's happening in Minnesota right now. So I'm interested in, in these African-American communities during the fifties and sixties as they attempted to protect their communities from urban renewal. One of the things I argue is that the notions of civic resistance and the notions of civic resistance, urban citizenship and democracy gain new complexity when we review when it is reviewed from within the cultural rhetorical traditions of African Americans. So with this as my goal, so with was this as my focus. So some of the things that I've learned about and some of the things I've discovered. Sometime in early 1964, Lucinda Gordon, the community director of the Milwaukee Urban League wrote letters to the director of continued education at Marquette University and to the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee Extension Division, requesting help in developing three leadership courses for quote, individuals working in our neighborhood organizations and in civic, and in civic groups. So out of that came these leadership seminars. The leadership seminar was offered in five weekly sessions between September and October, 1964, and were designed to quote, foster active participation by African-American residents in civic activities in the community. The seminar, end quote, the seminars were part of the Urban League's emerging leadership training for minority groups and they were offered in order to benefit the whole community. The program was open to minorities who lived in the Milwaukee area, 
for, quote, at least 18 months. She had to live in Milwaukee for at least 18 months. Keep in mind, all these people who are migrating and who are between, between the ages of 18 and 45. I don't know how they came up with those numbers, 18 and 45, but I find that you know, curious, especially for those who might be, those of us who are just outside of those numbers. The participants had to be recommended by the Urban League, clergy, youth organizations, schools, et cetera. According to the 1964 proposal, the leadership program had several goals to serve the city of Milwaukee, including, quote, providing qualified social conscious person who will assume the positions of leadership in the community and by helping prepare the participants for a more effective role in community development. In looking at the, the titles of the lectures that will be giving in this seminar, government structure, citizen preparation for involvement in public hearings, service of the Department of Public Works, ordinance on landlord tenant responsibilities, community renewal program, organization for social action. And I'm not gonna to go too deep, but I, I see this as a, as, a, as a site for rhetorical education, a space um, served as a training ground for, um, or a practice area for marginalized rhetors to develop their rhetorical skills before entering a white majority dominated public sphere. Um, the other thing too, I wanna to tell just a quick Madison story. When I was visiting Madison as part of the RSA Summer Institute a few years ago, I was able to do some research on this project. And, you know, we have these archive stories. So when I, when I, when I found the folder in, in um, about leadership seminars in the Urban League, and I opened up the folder, this, this speech communication one-on-one syllabus fell out. And that's just, you know, one of those little moments uh, uh, when you're doing archival work is like this gem. And, and so the way that they were thinking about leadership and organizing these seminars, um, they were also thinking about um, communication. And I don't mind, you know, although I'm in the English discipline, I don't mind giving a shout out to uh, our, our, our communication scholars and colleagues. So the Milwaukee Leadership Seminars were noteworthy, not only for offering a, a space for citizens to learn about urban renewal policies, but also connecting the idea of leadership with civic engagement in the African-American community. I contend, I contend that in many instances of the Black Freedom Movement, leadership often operated as an intercommunal re reciprocity, meaning that leaders were followers and followers were leaders. This reciprocity operates on a similar principle as the African-American rhetorical concept, call and response, which is a spiritual component to the rector's message that can only be validated by the audience's participation. By the audience participation to obtain a quote, the spiritual and harmonious balance. The specific ex exit in, ah, I can never say that word, exigency of the African-American community is that a model of leadership that is strongly oriented around one top-down figure making things happen is not sustainable in all situations. In fact, the primary conditions of political motivations require that people see leadership as a reciprocal relationship, which means bringing your gift, serving your talent, or sometimes stepping aside for the sake of the whole. So I see this, this, these seminars as a place where agency, black agency is being distributed. Um, another way that I've been thinking about this as well, and I, I, I've, I've recently read um, Ralph Ellison, the, the writer Ralph Ellison, characterizing ensemble jazz improvisation as a quote, antagonistic cooperation, both collaborative and competitive musicians play with and against one another to create art and community. I love this idea. I love thinking about this in the terms of a, of a social movement of a antagonistic co cooperation um, to create something bigger and larger than yourself. Um, 
Um, and this is what these seminars are doing, helping others to develop their own um, um, potential. The idea that all citizens are empowered to take action enables the African-American community to better resist the discriminatory policies, which simultaneously create a found while simultaneously creating a foundation of civic leadership in the community, which, strength, which strengthens the resistance against the changes to the neighborhood or to fight for better housing. So one of the org, one neighborhood organization that can be traced back to um, participants of the leadership seminars was one of the founding members of a, a organization called the Walnut Street Improvement Committee, also referred to as Waco. The mission of Waco was self-help urban renewal, um, which included cleaning up empty lots, pressing landlords to better maintain their properties, and buying and re uh, rehabilitating homes. Um, other accomplishments include painting over 100 buildings in the area, conducting trash removal drives, um, and offering low-income housing for residents. So again, the mantra for, for Waco and other neighborhood groups was active participation in your neighborhood is required as a requirement um, for citizenship. Um, and just to uh, provide a little bit more context, one of the master narratives of urban renewal were how these African-American communities were blighted. Some parts were blighted, but of course, not the entire community, not the entire neighborhood. So what you saw with some of these organizations and Waco being one of them is trying to clean up the neighborhood or clean up the neighborhood in order to make an argument that this area is not blighted. You know, let's try to work to improve it and not just destroy everything. So these are one responses to the context of, uh, of, of, of urban renewal and the dangers of urban renewal, um, trying to prevent um, or limit the destruction. Then another protest and probably um, another response is probably more well known here in Milwaukee was the increased uh, push for open housing. So here we have a, a, a large gathering in 1967 um, um, for the open housing campaign. Um, but this push began with Val Phillips, who was the first African-American politician to be elected to Milwaukee City Council in 1956. Um, she provided African-American residents one representative voice in the city's political arena. In 1962, Phillips championed a bill to alleviate the housing pressure within Milwaukee's African-American neighborhoods. If passed, the bill would have pro prohibited, quote, both formal and informal discrimination in the renting or selling of housing within the city, end quote. However, due to lack of the political power of African-Americans, the measure was defeated overwhelmingly year after year after year after year during the 60s. Avell Phillips recognized the power of media in her cause. Like Martin Luther King understood how Bull Connor would be a good foil, foil for protests in Birmingham, Alabama and draw media attention. Phillips understood the visual, what I think I'm calling right now a visual ethos, if you will. Um, understood how Father James Groppy, as an active ally, could draw more media attention to the fight for fair housing, for the fight to push open housing. In an oral history interview, Phillips said, quote, Groppy didn't join the fight until 1967. And he called and asked if he could join my cause. But after Groppy got in it, it got more attention than when I, than when I was doing, doing it all by myself. I have to give him his dues. Here was a white priest and these little black kids who were sort of ghetto kids. And it was just too movie-like for them, meaning the media, not to be attracted. 
And Grappi, even though I'm sure he enjoyed the intention, never ever tried to pretend like he was the main show. When they, meaning the media, come up to him, he said, hey, we're cool. We're just here to support Vell, end quote. And here we have an image of Grappi and Vell Phillips. This was during the 200 and consecutive days of protest um, from August 1967 to March 1968, um, protesting racial discrimination in housing across the city. Um, UWM has a digital project called March on Milwaukee, um, where a lot of these images and stories and, and, and biographies of these people um, are available, as well as the Encyclopedia um, of Milwaukee, which is also um, online. And of course, with any movements towards social justice, there will be what CNN commentator Van Jones calls a white lash. Cries for open housing, cries for fair, African-American cries for fair housing or open housing are met with calls for private property rights. But worse than dual phrases, uh, open housing uh, protests were sometimes met with physical violence. Mary C. Arms, former member of the NAACP Youth Council, remembered in a 2008 oral history view, interview that, quote, they were on top of those cars throwing light bulbs at us besides the bricks and bottles and sticks and anything and spitting. Little kids with t-shirts on saying, go home nigger. Again, um, for a deeper dive into their white resistance to, uh, to these open housing marches and protests, um, I again, again want to refer to you to my, my research partner, Ann Bonds and her lectures um, titled Rethinking White Supremacy in Precarious Times. So the legacy of these practices still affect us today. This is the 2011 map, color-coded breakdown of the racial demographics. Um, in Milwaukee County, shades of red is the percentage of African-American residents. Shades of blue are white residents. So as you can see um, um, in the surrounding counties around Milwaukee and in areas in Milwaukee County, uh, how segregated it is. Some have called Milwaukee the most segregated uh, place in the country. Um, in his book, Color of Law, Richard Rothenstein reminds us that quote, our system of official segregation was not the result of a single law that consigned African-Americans to designated neighborhoods. Rather, scores of racially explicit laws, regulations, and government practices combined to create a nationwide system of urban ghettos surrounded by white suburbs. So my research explores African-American abilities African-American residents' abilities to make their own rhetorical choices and highlights their struggles to acquire expanded civic rights, illuminating in, a, in the process the complex intersections of race, place, and power in Northern US cities, cities during the mid 20th century. The rhetorical strategies used by African-Americans in response to urban renewal and restrictive housing covenants I suggest demand further studies of community organization and protests within social movements, both historical and contemporary. But more importantly, what I think these historical cases show us and the value of understanding this type of rhetorical history is insight into the necessary yet often unacknowledged rhetorical work that makes larger social movements possible. When we as scholars, research these critical rhetorical histories of the Black freedom movement, we can combat against those who attempt to do what Eddie Glaude Jr. calls disremember events. 
Drawing from the Toni Morrison novel, Beloved, Blood writes that disremembering distort events and blots out loss. Disremembering is active forgetting. I will also add that disremembering prevents us from holding institutions accountable for, those, for their histories. When those who use the phrases, all lives matter or black on black crime, they're disremembering historical events. The roots and strategies of resistance in the places of these protests in the urban North can be found in the African-American fight against urban renewal in the 1950s and 1960s. Exploring and recovering such, such rhetorical histories are crucial for honoring the legacy of the unfamiliar names in the civil rights movement like Lucinda Gordon, who said, quote, I was part of a generation that helped break down barriers for African-Americans so they can reach their full potential. And I stood on the shoulders of those who came before me. So standing on her shoulders, I hope that the Digital Humanities Project um, co-produced with the local community, as well as my book on African-American organizing and resistance to urban renewal will help us to get a little closer to understanding how systemic racism works in our country and to begin to think of new ways to address housing problems in Milwaukee and across the nation in general. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Derek. Um, and we have plenty of time now for um, question and answers. So I'm going to go ahead and post in the chat just some basic discussion norms we're asking of folks. Um, so we're asking um, to ask a question, please either type your question in the chat or you can use Zoom's hand raise function, which I see some folks are already using. Um, and I'll serve as the moderator and call on you. And then in either case, whether you type your question in the chat or use the hand raise function, since we're all coming across from um, different institutions, if you could state your name and organization first, and then um, ideally your one sentence question and a few sentences to clarify if necessary. Um, and Derek, if you wouldn't mind taking off the screen share just so that we can all kind of see each other. There we go, perfect. All right, so um, with those norms, we'll go ahead and I see we have a question from Janelle. Thanks so much, Dr. Hanley. This was such a great presentation. Um, I don't know if I can hold to the one sentence. I'm gonna try, Kelly. Um, so I'm Janelle Johnson. I'm from the Department of Communication Arts here at UW-Madison. Um, so first, I really loved your story about the speech syllabus and I'm kind of dying to know whose who's it was. But that's, <laughs> that's kind of thing. But I think all of our ears perked up on com arts. Um, but my question has to do with the language of the covenants. And one of the things that was really striking to me when you put up the language from the Wauwatosa covenant is that it was identical word by word by word to a covenant that was also in place in the neighborhood that I live in now, which I discovered uh, when we bought our house here in Madison at Sunset Village. And it was li literally included with our house housing documents when we purchased our house. They included it as part of the package. So I'm curious about if you know those covenants, how that language circulated as a kind of boilerplate and whether or not it was something, you know, did you find a lot of similarities in terms of that language either within Milwaukee or in some of the different cities that you're looking at, or did each of them have slightly different language as part of the covenants? So let me say a uh, uh, great question and, and, and nice to meet you, Janelle. We're still in a process of that. This is the very beginning um, of giving me co these covenants and um, there's thousands, there are thousands. So this is, this is the front end of this, of, 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 of the project. Um, and um, that is something that's one of the questions I have as well. I'm also so if you if you look on the mapping prejudice website, they have covenants for Hennepin County there in um, 
in, in Minneapolis. And in, in, in some of those covenants, they were break, they were break down specific groups. You can't be, you can't be Asian, you can't be um Jewish, you can't be you can't be of African descent, Negro descent, and Ethiopian descent. One of them, they they just in case you didn't identify with one of those other ones, we're gonna make sure you don't try to come here. But what I've seen so far in 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 Milwaukee has just been you can only be a member of the Caucasian race. But we're talking maybe 15, 20. So um, that is a question I I do have is like, are they different in their boilerplate? Where do they come from? Um, so yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, what I can put in the in in the in the chat, Janelle, is there has just really only been one um published academic work about Milwaukee County um, covenants. And there's not the whole covenants, but there's clips from the different neighborhoods. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll put a link of that in, into the chat. And, um, 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 but just here in, Mil in, in Milwaukee County, there were, there were different ones. They're, each of them were different. So, um, but I'll, I'll share that with you. Thanks for that question, Janelle. Um, and it looks like next we have a question from Caroline. Hi there. Hey, Derek, thanks so much for your talk. It's really cool to see this project develop through time. Like it's wonderful to check in and thank you for um, sharing materials about the project with English 703 this semester. So I appreciate that too. Um, I'm Caroline gotchuk Drishki. sorry, from UW-Madison in Composition and Rhetoric. And my question is related to working on these sort of vernacular stories of regular folks who are impacted by really profound and significant changes. That's of interest to me. Mm -hmm. And um, I was thinking about that already when you showed the picture of the couple in the cleared mm -hmm. out lot, you know, for the, the expressway. And I'm just interested to hear more from you about how you're managing kind of methodologically how to access stories from regular folks, you know, how, how to figure out who's in that photo and how to figure out what their story was. Um, I'm just interested if you have good ideas and experiences about how you've dealt with that. Wow, you know what, so um, let me talk about from the from the book perspective. Right now, um, you know, be, Fortunately enough, there have been a lot of oral histories in which to to draw from. Um, but again, because I'm really interested in kind of has events, how events are happening in real time and not necessarily um, people looking back and reflecting it and, and remembering um, black newspapers have been a wonderful source for me. Um, um, the Pittsburgh Courier and analyzing what was going on in Pittsburgh. Again, these these newspapers are being printed in real time. Um, and the tentative title that I'm that I've used for my book, "The Places We Knew So Well Are No More," was this elderly woman um, story being told in the Pittsburgh Courier, and this it was like this two page feature. And she's recalling, you know, the heyday of the Hill District neighborhood. So, um, so that's, I think that is the goal. That's that's, you know, you know, trying to find that. So that's for the book project, um, for the mapping project. And again, uh, we're in the beginning stages, and you know, I'm thinking about, you know, these community workshops. That's that's an idea I have because I think for a lot of African Americans or you know maybe other ethnic groups as well we you have stories of when so and so went out to Whitefish Bay and try to buy a house or try to rent somewhere so see we can maybe actually capture some of those stories through the community workshop and and I think that's what's important to me is not not just the institutional voice who did what, what politician did what, what urban planner did what, but 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 the people on the ground, you know, like like what you're saying is so trying to capture those stories. So um, um, that's something I'm thinking about. 
Um, Want to get the book done first? <laughs> you know, uh, um, um, there is some overlap, but uh, but from the historical context, um, that's how I'm getting at it. Is the is the is the black newspapers? Thanks. Thanks for that question, Caroline. And it looks like next we have a question from Sarah. Thank you so much, Professor Hansley, for this lovely talk. Um, my name is Sarah McKinnon, and I'm in communication arts at UW-Madison. And I was really, my ears perked up when you talked about rhetorical agency at the beginning, or agency at the beginning. And I'm wondering if you can um, theorize with, with us, talk through with us, how you see um, this project speaking to that literature and like what, what you're offering to that literature. Um, and especially as I was listening, I thought about the, the, the long durée, the like historical view that you're really offering. And it I made me excited to think about agency in that context. Yes, you know what, uh, there was a time when I was just trying to avoid the word agency. I was a time of trying to avoid the word memory because <laughs> of these conversations. Um, but I but I've come back to agency and I and I and I and, and here's why. Uh, when I start looking at the civil rights movement, um what what you know what I observed, and this is not any new revelation, is 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 all this work that black women were doing in the movement and their conceptualization of, of, of um, leadership. And I, I, I'm drawing a blank on the, on, the, on the person's name who wrote about, um, I think Ella Baker and rhetorical leadership. I think I saw Catherine Olson in here. She might know the name of the article that I'm referring to because she referred it to me. Um, but what what I what what I am offering new is not from the traditional speaker on high making moves, follow me, pushing things, but what I'm thinking about how agency is distributed throughout the movement, if you will. Um, um, you see in uh, Septima Clark, um, these citizenship schools, um, Stokely Carmichael, these citizenship schools in the in the America in the in the Deep South during the Civil Rights Movement, and I'm putting this on par with the leadership um, seminar here in Milwaukee, where is this relationship between you know. Being an active citizen means being a leader in the community. And let's see, we can train more active citizens and more leaders, not just come follow me, but everyone is a, is a leader. So I think that's I think that's the thing that I'm trying to uh, um, to offer is this distribution of, of, of agency. So I'm not necessarily trying to, you know, I'm familiar, you know, uh, you know, the postmodern theories about agency and that debate, and 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 Cheryl um, Geisler's conversation about agency, and um, I so. But what I am what I am suggesting is a distribution of these places where agency is distributed, and where a person is a leader over here in this context, but they might be a follower over in that context. And, and again, drawing from the African American culture, rhetorical. Um, tradition of call and response. The, 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 the preacher can only preach if the audience is allowing him or her to preach. So together, it's, it's, it's under this umbrella of, of, of leadership. That's really exciting. I'm excited to read more about that. And I think it's an important contribution. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your question, Sarah. And it looks like um, Dr. Olson is working on pulling up that citation from us that you were thinking of, Derek, um, coming from Josh Miller. So um, looks like our next question is from Morris. Go ahead, Morris. Thanks, uh, thanks, Derek. Uh, I, uh, like Caroline, I'm excited to see how your uh, project is developing. Uh, so my question, I don't know if it's really a question, but um, I'm interested in maybe hearing you say a little bit more about infrastructure. 
um, when you when you mentioned that, I, I was thinking the exact same thing since um, we're seeing resistance to rethinking what infrastructure is. And so that, that kind of sparked the idea for me that um, the infrastructure has functioned as a racialized discourse and the resistance to infrastructure from people who are resisting it, you know, partly is because old forms of interest infrastructure allowed them to uh, do the kind of uh, racialized mapping that you describe, mm -hmm. uh, and that new forms of infrastructure might uh, be presented as a way to correct that. Um, mm -hmm. So can you just maybe riff off of um, infrastructure as a discourse and, uh, you know, anything that, uh, if that becomes a useful concept for you? Are you thinking about more, so you think about um infrastructure more in, in in the material context like specific buildings or uh, yeah i mean i think you know the way you describe how neighborhoods were um uh, raised in order to mm -hmm. um uh, make room for highways and i'm thinking about you know chicago where um uh you know housing projects were kind of created in particular neighborhoods um mm -hmm. so you know how does infrastructure how, how has it been used as a way to regulate um, black and brown bodies? And does okay. the rethinking of infrastructure threaten that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, um, there's, this, there's this quote, and I, I, I can't remember the author's name, um, who said about, um, you know, there are not very many black people in, in in Minnesota, but the highways found them. So there were the the mayor of was it the mayor or the governor? Maybe maybe it was the mayor of of St. Paul, um, Minnesota, apologized for it was it was by design. You know, the, the highway was designed to go through the Rondo Avenue um, 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 neighborhood. So I, I point out Minnesota, uh, St. Paul, Pittsburgh, Milwaukee, but you can, it was pick a city. It was pick a place. Pittsburgh, I just talk about one hill district where they tore down for arena, but across the river, they used the highways to block off Um as a as a barrier as a boundary between um, a white neighborhood and 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 and, and a black neighborhood that was one way to stop um, the spread. It's it's amazing when you read some of these materials in the same language that's being used about immigration today and and um, was being used in the fifties and sixties about you know the the Negro invasion from 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 the American South and these infrastructure was the, was the tools to combat that also another the cities were fearful of losing tax dollars to the suburbs so um in you know I'm in 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 the in in the book um um talking about how predominantly black spaces were trying to be transformed into white spaces. Um, whether it's an actual arena, which was the case in Pittsburgh, or even if it's just a highway, the highway is to be able to connect the white suburbs with the downtown. So it's more convenient for white people to, 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 to travel and, 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 and get to um, downtown to shop or, 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 or for whatever reason. So, um infrastructure was was very much um a part of it and um there there are research or there's there's research being done that actually uncovering you know some of these city planning notes and and and, and conversations um documents about how that how that was how that was the goal um i am still learning milwaukee i i am not a historian um, my wife, who is a historian, accuses me of wanting to be a historian. Uh, I do rhetorical history, so I'm still, still trying to, still trying to uh, learn some of this, um, this, these materials and these history. 
But the more you read, the more you come across, it's just like, you know, it's, 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 it's complex and it's, and it's, and it's by design, right? And the housing that were built often were not meant to be for um, black residents. And one thing I didn't think, one thing I didn't say, I, I forgot to say, uh, is how many people who got wealthy off of this system, right? If you, if you restrict people from where they can live, if they can't spread out, so you own places and you own properties in that area where people can only live, then you can charge them whatever you want. And many African-American residents were, were charged disproportionately high rents to the conditions in, in which they were living. So that has a has effect um, over, over time as well. Thank you for that question, Morris. And it looks like next we have a question from Allison. Go ahead. Hi, Dr. Hanley. Thank you so much um, for this talk. I'm Allison Prash. I'm in Com Arts at UW Medicine. Um, and my question is kind of a two part for you. Um, I, I was really intrigued by you talking about not only Milwaukee, but also your other case studies of Pittsburgh and St. Paul. I, I grew up in the Minneapolis suburbs and went to Minnesota for my um, graduate work. And so I was thinking through being in those places as you were talking. And so the first part of my question is, you kind of touched on this earlier, but um, just talking a little bit more about your specific, um, the what you're writing about and talking about in terms of, you know, these um, St. Paul and also Pittsburgh. And then the second question I had for you is, if in your archival um, research, you've found that these specific groups were really isolated in these specific cities, or if there was some collaboration and working together across these various Midwestern cities and what that might look like, um, if anything. Yes, great, great question. Um, let me let me take the second one first. Um, so, so in each of these cities, there were um, local chapters from Urban League and NAACP. Um, and um, I was doing some archival work. Um, actually, I think I opened up the, the, the book with it, where um, the local chapter of the NAACP is writing a letter to headquarters, say, hey, we need some help here. Um, they're talking about, and I'm paraphrasing, this is not what he said, I'm paraphrasing, but he's like, hey, we need some help here. You know, they, they, they're starting these urban renewal projects. What, what can you do to help us to, to, to talk about housing? So I imagine what, what you know, in, 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 in Milwaukee and Pittsburgh, these are smaller cities compared to, um, you know, Chicago and, and um, especially St. Paul, compared to Chicago, New York. So you might have, you know, like Lucinda Gordon was working for the NWCP, and then a couple of years later she was working for the Urban League. So there's all this intermingling, and people are 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 going on. So the communities are small, so they try to coordinate through the, um, through the the local office. I think that's one way. Two way, uh, another way is both the Pittsburgh Courier and the Chicago Defender were national news publications for African-Americans. Um, and so um, people could hear what was going on in other cities and they can read about them in other cities. I mean, these, the Courier and the Defender is the equivalent of the New York Times and Washington Post <laughs> in the 40s and 50s for, for, for African-Americans. Um, but a lot of them were just, uh, some of them were neighborhood organizations that were popped up, but you also had people who were part of the Southern civil rights um, um, movement um, and realizing, you know, we, we're down here doing stuff, but you know, there's things going on in our own city. Um, so I think because each city were, you know, different, um, political makeup at one time Milwaukee was actually socialism just just before some of this was 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 happening um, uh, 
I think there is always going to be a little nuance and a little difference in, in a different a different approach and what they could what they could do. The size of the African American population, I think, um, determines what they could do. So if there were some coordination, but I don't think we see it as a massive coordination like we do with with um, the Southern Civil Rights Movement. But they're all feeding off each other. They're all feeding off each other, and they're emboldening each other. Um, so let me stop right there. I hope I answer your question now. I say, oh, what was the first? What was the first question? Tell me again the first question. I was just asking about the other case studies, but that that was fantastic. So thank okay. you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for your question, Allison. Um, and we have plenty of time. As other folks have questions, feel free to use the hand raise function or type those into the chat. Oh, and uh, Dr. Olson posted that article that I was trying to think of, Empowering Communities, Ella Baker's Decentralized Leadership Style and Conversational Eloquence by J.H. Miller. Looks like we have a question from Rob. Go ahead. Hi, thank you. Thank you for this really um, wonderful talk. It seems like an amazing project. Um, my name is Rob Asin. I'm in ComArts at UW-Madison. So um, with respect to your um, digital mapping project, you had mentioned um, early on um, that you planned to use citizen researchers. Um, mm -hmm. I wonder if you could say more about that. I, I understand you, know, you said this project is in its early stages, um, but could you talk to us for a little bit about um, what you anticipate the role would be, how they would work in terms of the overall project? Right, so um, we're drawing this model from from what the folks at uh, Mapping Prejudice um, has done. So the way it works is when you get these racist covenants. So it's I don't want to go too deep into the weeds of of trying to explain it because I'm learning it myself. The software to identify and then it gets changed into. Um, a document that we can use. So we take the documents once once it's been identified. Um, and again, we're talking about thousands of documents. And so there will be a group, there will be a community workshop and each of them, you know, you got to get like five people to read it and, and to confirm that, yes, this is a racist covenant. You know, you think about when you're doing a a, a word search on a on a PDF or you know that OCR. I want to look up the word blight, right? And then you find that that word is actually might have been used in a newspaper ad, not necessarily an article. So we we want to get you know people to help. Okay, five people confirm that this covenant is actually a racist housing covenant and not not something else. So that's that's how the, the community is going to be brought up. And again, when you're talking about thousands, there's no way that two <laughs> two researchers and whatever RAs we can get can 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 do that. But also, you know, help the community to be a part of it, you know, um as um I think I think it was was Janelle said you find out that you know your own house is is one of these these covenants. Um, the other thing that that um, that I mentioned before, as far as citizen researcher is is, if you know, you know, during these work workshops, you know, if there's someone in your family. I'm thinking about African Americans who has a story about regarding housing. Get that story for us. Be let's be a part of it. Let's let's capture these these stories. Um, without a full knowledge of how these digital projects worth work or the bandwidth, I don't know. We can maybe capture a, a, a you know, um, a minute or two, you know, on on, on this site. Um, um, what's that? What's the on Fridays on NPR where they have these little interviews? Uh, I forget the name of it. Someone type the name of that in the chat for me. StoryCorps. You know, can we can we can we maybe just get a little StoryCorps? Can we house that? I mean, I want to hear those stories. I talk about um, Vale Phillips in one of her oral history interviews. 
Now here you are as an, um, a, a politician or a husband, I think um, was like one of, you know, I think he was in education. Part of me want to say principal, but I'm, I might not be sure. I'm, I'm thinking I might be confusing. But here they are, they're looking for homes. They're looking for homes um, in East Park, East Side of Milwaukee. And um, when they show up, you know, the agent's like, oh, um, you know, this home is no longer available, right? Um, we have story, I, I, you know, what are those, what are those stories? You know, what stories that they may have? And um, um, we have a lot, I think there's a lot about the 50s and 60s, but part of me want to know, I mean, these covenants were down in the 1910s. I mean, were there lawsuits? Um, maybe someone in the community know of a lawsuit of a, of a person that might have failed. So, um, but the biggest thing we want this to be a community is both be a community project and hopefully a site for uh, um, scholars to, to participate. So. Any of those grad students who are thinking about, you don't have a, 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 a good solid dissertation project or any Milwaukee ties, you know, come on down, <laughs> come on down. Okay. And Rob, can I say one thing sure. to you? Um, this is like full circle for me. Okay. Uh, as a grad student, I was at a panel, it must've been RSA um, that you were part of, you know, um, um, discourse and citizenship and in, 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 in that article. And someone had asked a question um, about what's the value in work with um, looking at groups of people in the middle of a lost cause or something like that. And that's something that resonated with me, that question and being part of that panel discussion. Um, we all know the results of urban renewal. We all know that the buildings were torn down and the highways were built, were built up, but there's still some value in, in, in uncovering what were people doing in that moment? What were they doing? What were they trying to do and, and stopping that? So and I remember that being covered in your panel discussion. So that's a little surreal moment I wanted to share with you, Rob. Thanks. Well, well, thank you. And this is such great work and I'm so excited for the book. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you for that question, Rob. And it looks like um, we have another question from Caroline. Go ahead. Hi, thanks. I don't want to steal anyone else's time, but this is, this is Caroline again. And if we have time, um, without getting too into the weeds of it, I um, am interested to hear more, if you know more at this point, I know you're sort of on the front end of this, about the actual sort of technical piece of trying to map this. So this, this is just an issue in my own work, so, so I want to bring it up. But I think that a lot of us, as we're interested in you know, public discourse, social movements, I think a lot of rhetoricians are great at thinking spatially. We're sort of moving into this moment of, oh yeah, this would make a great interactive map, or we could place these stories on a map. So as I'm running into that, I have some colleagues with some technical expertise, but we're running into issues of funding, for instance, that it's more expensive than we anticipated. And so I'm just curious to hear a little bit how you're managing some of that, the sort of public interface piece as you think about drawing in stories and documents and photos and things. Caroline, that's the next step. And that's a great question, because I that's where I am right now. Um, again, we literally just got funding for this, um, I think a week and a half ago. Um, and, um, you know, I'm learning, I, I've done a couple of GIS workshops and learning about that. And uh, I kind of wish my, my, my colleague who's in geography maybe can speak more to um, about that because I've been told there's been new developments in GIS in which the ways they can do this, you can map different things. One of the things, one of the questions I have is being able to overlay the, the growth of, of, of the housing covenants with the growth of the African-American population. Is there any coordination? Is there things that we, that we can see? Um, um, I mentioned the March on Milwaukee um, digital project that's on UWM library um, 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 site, and they have a map there. We want to update that map. We want to see the routes. 
I want to see the routes during those 200 days of protests where they walk in the neighborhoods they actually had racist housing covenants. Um, so we can probably map the route. Um, but these individual stories, these individuals, I don't, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how that's going to look in the layout of, of, of the website. Um, you know, we got to find someone to, 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 to build the website. Um, at University of Minnesota and Mapping Prejudice, I mean, for, for there's a whole team just devoted to this. This is, this is their work. And, and perhaps at some point, depending on the funding, maybe we can um, hire someone for it to be, you know, a full-timer to do that. Because right now, juggling our other duties and, 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 and things, but, but that's, that's where we are, is, is this, how can we do this technologically? And then not only that, um, where to host the site and the, the maintenance and, 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 and the size and the, and, and the scope. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of questions, unfortunately, um, a lot of questions that still to be answered. Um, so maybe you all bring me back in two years and I'll have, a, <laughs> I'll have an answer to, uh, to some of these questions. That's awesome. Thank you. And it was a selfish question. I haven't, I haven't solved it either. I'll be sure to share with posted. you. I definitely will. Definitely will. That would be great. Wonderful. Thank you for that, Caroline. And it looks like now a question from Megan. Go ahead. Hi, thank you so much. Um, for this talk, I learned a lot and it was really interesting. Um, I wanted to make this, this idea of like distributed, distributed agency is so, so compelling. Um, I, I think it is to me because I'm interested in like digital stuff. So it like seems to work really well there. Um, but what really, one thing that really struck me about um, your talk was this um, idea of like folks in a neighborhood trying to um, like change the change the physical space of the neighborhood um, mm -hmm. to as like an argument against these these policies and so thinking about like the physical changing of space as like um, a mode of like public deliberation but also one that's like so situated in history so I was wondering if you could like connect this idea of distributed agency um, to like space and also history like at that like all these things seem to be happening at that nexus, but I don't know if like we can do that in five minutes or not, but you know, that's, you, you're giving me, you're giving me a new way to articulate this and, and, and to frame this. I'm glad this is being recorded so I can come back and listen to this question again. Um, I think, so Waco, was his, which was the organization in Milwaukee and Pittsburgh had them too, which is amazing. So again, this master narrative of blight. And, and you think, you know, you think these words are being used as an argument when they really wasn't being argued in good faith. The cities were going to tear down these cities regardless. And they had to put the label blight in order to get the money from the federal government. But yet you had these um, these cleanups organizations and beautifying the neighborhood. Um, uh, uh, in Pittsburgh, there was a group that were driving city officials to specific parts in the neighborhood and say, look, see, look, this is pretty. This, what are you talking about? Um, uh, I don't know how, but I, I, I I, I somehow see kind of like a, a, a connection with politics of respectability, if you will. Um, um, but, but yeah, that was being part of it. That was, you know, to save our country, I mean, to save our neighborhood, to save our, we all have to be a part of this. And so if you can, when Wake Out's giving out these pamphlets to the residents and, uh, um, to, to be a part of that beautifying, I think that is a as, as a distribution of agency, um, and and part of this work for me is really thinking about how African Americans conceptualize citizenship, as opposed to other people, where the citizenship is an is an is an is an active engagement, right? It's active, 
I'm, 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 I'm drawn from Asen's work here. It's, it's active. It's, it's, it's being, it's not just voting. Um, although voting is a big part of it. You know, why do African-Americans disproportionately vote in elections? Because if you don't vote, I'm being facetious here, because if you don't vote, your houses will get torn down. A highway would come through it. So you had to be, you had to be active. And not only that, you have these people who are migrating. And, and this is also a nexus, this idea of place and movement that I'm really been thinking about um, in African-American history um, that, that Ira Berlin talks about. Um, you have these people who are coming from the South who are, they don't even, they're not even thinking about voting. They don't even know how to vote because they weren't permitted to vote. But you also, so, but then you have this hunger to, to, to be a part of it. And um, um, now I'm drawing from my personal connection. My mother who migrated to Pittsburgh from North Carolina um, you know, who grew up seeing segregated signs, um, not permitted to vote and come to Pittsburgh. And that's all she's about. I and mean, it's about, she was, she was part of the Democratic National Committee, the NAACP Eastern Branch. And every election she's working at the polls. And I was just like, mom, can you just stay home? But there's this, there's this hunger, there's this hunger to be part of the process. So I, I, <clears throat> I think I think this conceptualization within African Americans um, to see what the negative things government can do in order to increase their voices, in order to change, in order hopefully that the federal government can can work for for them. But to get back to your question, Megan, and and, and I can like I said, I can I'm I'm going off in different directions. I do see that. I can see that. I can see that just going out and picking up litter is 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 an, is part of a distributed leadership and Waco was doing that and Waco learned that from what Lucinda was was putting together in these le uh, leadership seminars and this is just this continued circulation um, Waco also had a youth group when they were doing you know they were also doing uh, youth seminars and, and African history projects, the self-help urban renewal. So they're, they're, they're passing knowledge, knowledge on in, in, in different ways. Wonderful, thank you for that question, Megan. And it looks like we are just at 4.30. Um, so if you could all join me in sending some virtual applause once again to um, Professor Handley for his talk this afternoon. And I just wanna thank all of you for sticking around until 4.30 on a beautiful Friday um, and for being a part of our symposium these last two days. We really appreciate it. And thanks everyone for showing up to these events and for all of your support. Thanks for coming. I wish we could have done this in, in, in person. I'm only right down the street in Milwaukee, but <laughs> soon this pandemic is over, I'll be sure to come visit Madison. I love Madison. So thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good weekend.